Hi, I'm, I'm Jack Lewin. I'm a physician uh, who spent a lot of time in California. And so I, that's the, the, uh, the reason I know half, you, half of you in the room, and it's really great to see people. It's great to be here. It's also great to be uh, chairman of the National Coalition on Healthcare uh, is one of the hats I wear. And I, I, so I'd like to introduce our panel and then um, make a, a couple of minutes of remarks before the panel begins. But um, Jerry Kaminsky is the Professor of Health Policy and Management uh, and Director of UCLA Center for Health Policy Research. Uh, he's been around the block on a lot of these issues in terms of the public insurance programs, Medicare, Medicaid, and so forth. So it's great to have you here. Uh, Jeff Joyce is an Associate Professor and Chair of the Department of Pharmaceutical and, and Health Economics at USC uh, and Director of Health Policy, yep, yeah, uh, at the Leonard Schaefer Center. Um, it's also associated with the National Bureau of Economic Research, so great to have you. Uh, Kathy Donison, Chief of the Office of Health Plan Administration, Health Policy Benefits with CalPERS. Uh, just a, a minor job there with all the HMO uh, plans and all the PPO plans and the association plans. Terrific uh, perspective to have you with us. Jeff Rydot, I've known through uh, many steps of, a, of an illustrious career. Um, and uh, he's currently the, uh, the President Chief Executive Officer at the Integrated Healthcare Association and Chairman of the Contra Costa Interfaith Housing group, and he's on the board of directors of a number of uh, important companies. I was with Emeticis for a while, by the way, back in the day. Susan Hoagland, uh, I've known for many, many years as well. Uh, she's the uh, executive vice president of the California Academy of Family Physicians with 10,000 members here in California. She's been doing this since 91. That's what, 27 years? Wow. Pretty amazing. We've, we've been through a lot of adventures together in those years. And then Tam Ma is uh, here from Health Access California, which has been promoting uh, access to care in an emphatic and, and powerful way for, for many years. And uh, she, she obviously works with uh, dear friends of mine, Anthony Wright, and Beth Capel, and others. So it's a great group of people. Uh, and I think the perspectives are going to be quite enlightening for everybody here. I'll just say to you a few perspectives I have in my career in which I've seen healthcare from just about every angle. I've been a hospital, I've run a hospital system, I've started some health plans from scratch, or I've practiced as a doctor in many capacities. Uh, a lot of people think I'm a cardiologist because uh, I have an FACC. I'm just one of three doctors who was awarded an FACC because of my research in the field, but I never went through the fellowship. Uh, saved myself uh, three or four years there. Um, but basically, I have really seen healthcare from so many different angles. I'm public health director in Hawaii for eight years and in the US Public Health Service for many years. So uh, I've seen a lot of what's going on. And what really gets me is, is why I'm so attached to the, the, the core of the NCHC, which is what we're doing is unsustainable. Um, we're, healthcare is vampirizing virtually every sector of the economy if we don't together figure out how to provide solutions. Um, and, you know, 30 to 40 percent of the healthcare investment, I haven't heard this today, but at least that much isn't producing any health. So there's an enormous amount of waste in the system. Um, and we've got to deal with that in order to finance the rest of what we're doing. Um, but a lot of elusive issues out there. We, we, want about, we want value, but we're moving increasingly toward fee for service, even in states like Massachusetts and others that had already moved toward capitated new, new kinds of payment models. We're going backwards in that regard. Um, data interoperability. When David Brewer and I first talked with excitement, when he was the first ONC director in Washington, is that 20 years ago now? We're no further with the interoperability agenda than we were then. And so we can't exchange data to do what we need to do, both in, both in research and in healthcare outcomes improvement and all the rest of what we do, integrating social determinants with healthcare determinants. Um, variation, you know, we, is, is, a, is a nightmare still. I mean, if you, in fact, even just in terms of the U.S. is number 30, I think, in, in, in terms of health status among nations of the world, developed nations. But, uh, you know, actually within the, within the U.S., Utah and Minnesota would be in the top five. So uh, variation is, uh, is an elusive thing. We, we're, we're wasting a lot of money by not using the providing the best care to everybody out there. And uh, we know how to do it. Uh, obviously, better prevention uh, is important, and we're in an obesity epidemic. And, you know, we, we need delivery system reform with all this stuff, too. And we know how to do that. But, uh, and maybe California is the leader there in some ways. Um, some states are, are out there, too, Utah, Minnesota, and others. But anyway, there's a long way to go. In the meantime, <clears throat> uh, you know, healthcare is complicated, and who knew? You know, 
Um, uh, you know, that famous quote. But the administration is lurching forward, um, and um, they're going to decrease access and increase costs. I don't think they really know it. Um, the Congress aspires to some, some very dangerous things, decreasing the entitlements of, of Medicare and Medicaid. Um, they're going to increase premium costs for middle Americans. <clears throat> and, you know, they're gonna, that's going to return millions of people to the emergency department again. You know, so let's keep Antala on the books, I guess. So these are troubled times. And uh, that's why we need the, the National Coalition on Healthcare to, to promote increasing value, to, um, to protect and promote the entitlements and all the programs out there that, that are providing access, to decrease pharmaceutical costs, to increase chronic disease treatment and efficiency, a big part of our agenda, um, including social determinants, um, all around sustainability. So I asked this panel um, in preparation to come today to be ready to answer two questions for the National Coalition that will help us in our work in Washington and elsewhere in the country. Um, and the one, the question one was, what do you think are the two or three most important strategies that we should consider and, and could implement to promote affordability? And that's, you know, also going to get, you know, to better access and better quality, incidentally. And then second, what are the key actionable barriers that we could, we could, you know, get beyond to implement these strategies. And then later I want to talk, ask again a little bit about innovation uh, to all of you. So, so why don't we start um, with uh, Jerry to, to enlighten us. Thank you. Okay, good. Thank you very much, Jack. So um, uh, I just have a few slides, and our, our opening comments are intended to be brief. So I'm going to focus on coverage gaps in California and, and some of the possible solutions that are being discussed in the state uh, to deal with these coverage gaps. So the first slide that you see here is my new favorite slide. And uh, I think that this slide is really a, a great uh, uh, illustration of the concept that a picture is really worth a thousand words. There are many stories that this slide tells, but the story that I want to focus on is, first of all, the overall dramatic reduction in the percentage of uninsured by in every age category um, in the United States. This is not California specific. This is national data. Um, also point out that um, whenever uh, we uh, institute policies that have cliffs uh, and we uh, the ACA, for example, allows uh, adult children up to age 26 to stay on their parents' policies. Well, I've inserted the red arrow to show what happens. That's the, the age 26, 26-year-olds have the highest rate of uninsurance in the United States still, despite the fact that they've also had some of the most significant improvement. They've come down from about 33% uninsured to around 16%. Uh, but the, the, the other uh, point of the slide, and this is relevant to California as, as well, is that you know we've got social programs that do a fairly good job for children, but we could do a lot better. There's no way that a country uh, as wealthy as ours uh, should have 5% uh, of children being uninsured. It's just unconscionable, in my opinion. And of course, because of the Medicare program, you can see that virtually everybody above age 65 has coverage. So it's the working population. We have good employment-based insurance in the United States, but people fall through the cracks. Not everybody has uh, uh, employment-based insurance, despite the ACA, because not every employer is required to offer insurance. And so as a result, people fall through the cracks, and that's what the ACA was intended to do, to begin to fill in some of those cracks. Uh, and uh, it, has, it has done that, but as we've already heard today, there are uh, still affordability issues um, uh, uh, with, the, with the ACA. And a lot of people don't qualify for subsidies, but even those who do find uh, that they're struggling with affordability of, of health care and health care expenses. Uh, roughly 3 million Californians remain uninsured. This is uh, based on data that a projection that we did for Covered California about a little over a year ago. We have updated numbers now, but uh, I'm not sure. I just presented them to Covered California staff on Monday. Uh, the numbers are a little bit different. Um, but. Uh, if we're talking about how do we close the coverage gap in California, the fact is that the remaining uninsured population actually consists of several different populations. And the largest percentage or the largest group, almost 60%, 1.8 million people almost, are those who are not eligible for benefits because of their uh, immigration status. So uh, if we're talking about getting to virtually universal coverage in the state of California, we've got to have a policy that addresses this significant uh, large 
uh, portion of the uninsured population. We have a small percentage that are still eligible for Medi-Cal, and as we've discussed with, with Covered California, you might say that this group is effectively insured because even though they may not be signed up for the program now, when they show up for, for care, they're eligible and will more than likely be signed up. So uh, it's not to say that we shouldn't make an effort to make sure that everybody who's eligible is enrolled, um, uh, but uh, this is a group that uh, uh, will get coverage when they show up for care. So we've got, in this estimate, roughly 400,000. Our latest numbers suggest that it may be 550,000 people who are still eligible for subsidies but not um, uh, taking advantage of them, and then another uh, half million people who are not eligible for subsidies. And these are individuals who have affordability challenges. So. What are some of the options that are being uh, discussed in California? There's no time for me to go into detail. I'm just listing them. But I've categorized them into three big categories. The first is go big or go home. Let's do something bold and let's do it immediately. Uh, and that's what SB 592 is. Single payer, we're going to capture $400 uh, billion in spending, make it part of the state budget, and get rid of waste and inefficiencies, and everybody will be covered, no problem. Um, We've got also other single-payer alternatives that have not been introduced to the legislature, but clearly the Laura bill is not the only way to develop a single-payer system. And then there's another alternative, uh, which is a bold approach, which is all-payer rate setting. And that's not getting a lot of discussion, although it does get a brief discussion in the select committee's report. Second category, slow and steady wins the race. Uh, 14 bills were introduced on Friday. Uh, based on the report on the Select Committee on Healthcare Delivery Systems and Universal Coverage. And this includes a wide variety of bills that would basically tweak um, the ACA, uh, expand the Medicaid program to anybody regardless of, of um, immigration status. Um, and we can talk about some of these in, in more detail as well. Then finally, I think the third category is that failure really is not an option. If California sits back and just hopes, if we hope that things get better, in Washington, that the logjam persists, that the repeal and replace gets stalled because there aren't enough senators to vote even for 50, uh, to get to 50 votes. Uh, that is that is not, uh, in my opinion, a safe strategy or a wise strategy. Uh, uh, the actions that have already taken place are whittling away at the progress that we've made. Our recent estimates are that uh, with the repeal of the mandate penalty, uh, that next year, uh, as many as 900 or 850,000 Californians will be newly uninsured. That's not just from covered California, but it's across all insurance categories. So um, doing nothing is going to, to uh, turn back the clock, and we really can't afford to do that. So I'll stop at that point. Thank very you good. Very you know, I'm, I'm sure we all have a bunch of questions, but we'll, we'll, we'll pose those in a bit. Um, I'm very excited to be here. 20 years ago, I graduated from USC with my doctorate in public education or public administration, and I'm very happy to be home. I haven't been home in, in a very long time. My presentation is really going to focus more on our self funded uh, plans, our PPOs, preferred provider organizations, as well as uh, another over 500,000 HMO and PPO members that we have being managed under a pharmacy benefit management program. So CalPERS for, for that population is fully at risk. It's self-funded. We are both the plan as well as the purchaser and the purchaser for all of the other HMO products that we offer. I've been asked, or we've been asked, to talk about three strategies we think have potential in going forward in facing affordability. Uh, I will be talking to you about the latest design that we have for our PPO per select product, which used to be a narrow network, and now it's a value-based insurance design product that will launch in 2019. I'm also going to talk to you about how we are facing strategies of affordability in pharmaceuticals. And what are those barriers to affordability? Um, pharmaceuticals gets a lot of press, and there's a lot of finger pointing on who's to blame. And finally, I'm going to talk to you about reference-based pricing, which we launched for hips and knees in 2011, and then expanded to ambulatory surgery centers in 2012 for three procedures, uh, colonoscopy, arthroscopy, and cataract surgery, and what we're doing to move forward on that front. So I want to start with value-based insurance design. I'm going to call it VBID. 
Um, it is a new approach in terms of insurance design that brings in value. And the way we now define value, which we've been defining actually since 2001, value used to be uh, cost and quality. We now consider value cost, quality, safety, and evidence. So that's how, where we are today after nearly 16 years on uh, talking about uh, value. The value-based insurance design approach is one in which we studied uh, a few states on who was moving forward. We studied Oregon. We, start, we studied Washington. We studied um, Connecticut. And we studied Minnesota. And so we were looking at all the different designs that other uh, purchasers, such as the, the state of California and these other states, were approached in terms of how to build value into an insurance design. Again, our VBID is for a PPO. We have lots of members in HMOs, including Kaiser, but today I'm just going to talk to you about our value-based insurance design. In studying those other designs, we came up with an, a unique feature of how to deal with deductibles. Um, one of the speakers this morning talked about, I think it was Peter, talked about um, having a copay versus coinsurance. And so our PPO designs have quite a bit of coinsurance embedded in them, but we also have quite a bit of uh, copay that is part of uh, more primary care and less of inpatient or emergency room care. And so for our value-based insurance design for our per select product, we upped our deductible from 500 for a single individual to 1,000 for a single individual. And we also upped it for families. We did that so that we could then start providing deductible credits to bring it back down to where it is today. So the, the idea is use economic incentives to get our members assigned to primary care and to give, give them the opportunity to have a primary care or personal doctor direct their care. Uh, we, the five things that we assigned $100 per thing to do for the deductible was, first of all, engage in a biometric screen. That can be done at home or it can be done in a lab. And I'm seeing that I have one minute, <laughs> so I'm going to speed it up. <laughs> um, so I want to talk about the personal physician model. And this is where we assign them to a personal physician who will direct their care. They'll do those five things. They'll get $500 off the deductible, and they'll get a $10 copay. Now I want to talk to, about pharmacy affordability. Um, we looked at uh, the barriers to affordability in terms of uh, what do we have to overcome. We have to overcome complicated pricing models, formulary design, uh, tiering, new drugs coming to market, and what's not known too much about is medical pharmacy, that is pro provider pro in, uh, administered pharmaceuticals. The way we're making drugs more affordable is unified purchasing with our sister organizations, such as Covered California, Department of General Services, CalVets. Um, we are looking at a reference price by therapeutic class, and there's a lot of interest from other states there. And we're also looking at uh, how we're pricing our specialty drugs. We're also going to launch an academic detailing product, um, as well as one, a direct value purchasing program in which we're looking at buying direct uh, obesity drugs, a, a, a um, weight reduction drug, um, that will then be used to, in primary care, working with personal physicians to manage weight loss, and similar to a non-smoking or a smoking cessation program. So those are the main activities that we'll be working on in 2018 and into 2019. And then we're also looking at expanding our reference pricing program uh, beyond just the three I told you about, to another 12 procedures, and that is to keep moving our patients out of expensive outpatient hospitals to ambulatory surgery centers that provide uh, cost and quality similar or equal, equal to or better than the hospital, but two and a half times less the price. So we'll be doing that for both the ambulatory surgery centers 
as well as um, trying to move as many patients as we can for provider-administered drugs, either into the office, the home, or the transfusion center. So that's kind of where, where we're going. All right. That's great. Kathy, let's, yeah. let's, let's see whose slides come up now. <laughs> And this is a good segue. Actually, at the break, um, someone in the audience was saying, that, did you see the recent poll that said that prescription drug prices were the number one uh, issue among the American population? Generally, I think healthcare is in the top three. I didn't know drugs were that high. Um, but I think a lack of, of initiative and, and action on the federal side has led states to take on controlling drug spending. And I'm briefly just going to talk about that. But I think before we get into it, I, I want to put it in perspective. I think... Uh, you can look at this glass half full or half empty. And from the pharma industry perspective, they say, look at national health expenditures and prescription drugs are still 10% of total healthcare spending. Um, yet drugs are the mainstay or the cornerstone of how we treat most chronic diseases in the US. So why are we being bashed? Hospital costs are 31, 32% of healthcare spending. Physician services are about 21 or 22%. And there's a disproportionate anger towards the pharmaceutical industry. If you look at Medicare, about 17% of their budget, when you put Part D and, and B together, is prescription drugs. So clearly, seniors lose, use a lot more medications, and it's a more substantial part of their budget. And then if you talk to private employers who have younger populations, who have lower hospitalization rates, so then drugs become a bigger portion of their total health spend. They'll say it's one-fifth to a quarter of their health care spending. So you can look at it as, well, it's, is it one-tenth, or is it a fourth or, or, or a fifth of, of health care spending? That, I think, affects how we view this issue. And again, as, as I mentioned, sort of the uh, recent last summer, the Yale School of Public Health and Law School came out with a joint report, report uh, entitled Curbing Unfair Drug Prices. Got lots of attention. And their basic premises with the cost of prescription drugs was just unsustainable. And one of the bullet points said that spending on drugs was increasing faster than any other component of health care. Well, spending was, but prices aren't. And so if you just look, this looks at net to, to discounted prices in the bars, but if you just look at those uh, lines, the annual increase in prescription drugs over a roughly six year period from 20, 2007 to 13 was in the zero to 5% per year. Now we use more pharmaceuticals, but price per, per drug had not increased over that time. We did see the spike in 2013 to 15. A lot of that was driven by the hep C drugs. But I think the industry's argument is prices aren't rising nearly as fast as being perceived in the public uh, domain in the debate. A second uh, bullet point in the, in the Yale report was a growing number of Americans report difficulty affording their medications. And that's, we see that in poll after poll. But if you look at what people pay out of pocket at the point of care, again, premiums aside, if you look at those dark blue bars from 2013, they're for branded drugs, the average copay has fallen over time. And if you look at that sort of brighter green bar, those are generic drugs, we've seen copay and cost sharing, excuse me, not just copays, including deductibles, have fallen. So the industry's argument is prices have actually not increased that much. And actually what we've, the burden on patients is not increased. And we're, there's sort of a disconnect between the sort of public dialogue and what we see in the data. Irrespective of that, I think states have then said, we have to do something about this. The federal government has not. And in 2017 alone, there were more than 80 pricing bills in, in, in proposed in over 30 states in the country. Three states, Maryland, New York, and Nevada, passed legislation last year. Uh, to lower drug prices in different forms, and several other states are considering similar bills. They typically target excessive pricing on both generic and branded drugs. So the, on the branded side is typically how do we prohibit um, unfair launch prices, the $50,000 cancer drug, something of that nature. And on the generic side, how do we cap annual price increases? And I, and I do think there's a, a very distinct market on the brand versus generic, and the policy prescriptions are different, but that's for another conversation. But again, another part of the state level legislation has been to demand pricing information from manufacturers, detailed pricing information on development costs, manufacturing, how much you spend on marketing. And often these have been in response to egregious cases. So the Maryland Fair Pricing Bill that passed last year was explicitly almost written in response to the EpiPen. It prohibits unconscionable price increases that for essential generic drugs 
or drug-device combos used to deliver generic drugs, which is exactly what the EpiPen is. It's a generic medication in a patented injector. Um, and so what it requires the manufacturer to impose, um, to, to impose, uh, imposes price increases to justify that to the attorney general. And their threshold that they're using now is over 50% increase in a year. Um, the transparency bill that passed in Nevada is specific to insulin price increases. So anyone who's, who knows anyone treating uh, diabetes, insulin prices, at least list prices, have increased dramatically. The invoice, the price to the manufacturer has not gone up that much. But they passed legislation that requires the manufacturers of essential treatment of diabetes meds, diabetes meds alone, that they have to report annually to the state. What does it cost them to produce? What did they spend on marketing and advertising? How much did they earn? What was the acquisition cost? How much did they give in rebates? A level of transparency that we would never see in any other industry. And then in California, we passed uh, Senate Bill 17, which requires uh, manufacturers to notice the state, to notify the state and the health insurers if they've increased their medication price more than 16% over a two year period. And there are a couple quotes that this is gonna address um, unrelenting price increases. And Ed Hernandez, one of the authors of the bill, said other states are going to copy this because it's so uh, creative and, and important. And again, I, I, I'm not sure these are the right policies. I see why states are doing it in response to a lack of action on the federal side. Um, and I think ensuring access to, to uh, high-cost therapies is an absolutely worthy goal that we should consider. And as Dane, I think, mentioned, out-of-pocket maximums are much more targeted and directed as our annual caps on uh, the highest cost drugs and high, high users of medications. That's targeting, I think, access. But I think trying to put price controls in the drug market itself, I think, is somewhat misplaced. We all know there are many problems in our healthcare system, and whether that it's 10% of healthcare or 20% of healthcare spending, imposing price controls in one sector, I don't think is a good long-term policy. I don't think it effectively addresses our broader issues. And if we're looking within the pharmaceutical market, um, generally economists say we should, the profit should go to the innovators. And I think there's too much being eaten up in the supply chain. Uh, plenty of people here at Schaefer Center have been working on that research in the past uh, several years. One notion that's been talked around is what happens if PBMs were covered under ERISA? For example, if they had to act in the best interest of their client, let's say USC, their employer, how would that change price transparency, the types of drugs that, that, that uh, are on formulary or off formulary, and the overall um, tenor of drug pricing and negotiation in the marketplace? One simple move like that, I think, would open up this market in, in simple ways. All right. That's good. So let's, uh, let's go on then to Jeff. Jeff Rideout. Good morning, still. Uh, thank you very much, Jack, for inviting me to the panel. Um, a couple things I'd say to start. I think the quote from the president was that um, who knew? It was actually no one knew. I think it <laughs> yeah. was a more affirmative statement yeah. <laughs> that, that none of us knew. Um, I wanted to just cover a couple things. I've got um, just three slides to kind of prep the audience. Um, Amy Gwynn Howe actually um, mentioned this already, and um, it's the atlas from the Integrated Healthcare Association. And I really want to stress for this audience, this is a resource for the state. Uh, we, it was designed to be that, and we really, really would like people to use it just like Amy did in her presentation. Um, it's a voluntary um, program that is funded by the California Healthcare Foundation, and we get all of the data from 10 health plans on a voluntary basis. So it's a tremendous resource that we were fortunate enough to be able to uh, pull together. It won't last forever if people don't use it. And uh, we're in our second round. The California Healthcare Foundation funded a third round. That information will come out later this year. So I'm spending a little bit of time on it because I think one of the th big takeaways for this audience would be these resources exist uh, for people to use and we'd like you to use them. They are standardized measures of quality, uh, total cost of care that includes patient cost sharing and that's really, really important I think, as well as utilization. So uh, you can go in and play the website uh, addresses down there below, it's open now. Um, we have some guides and some stories that can help you to key uh, findings that we're finding, but it's really a resource for the community to use as they see fit. Um, Amy presented this already, so I'll just uh, zoom back to the punchline. One of the things that I wanted to point out where the circles are, the high quality, lower cost regions are all in Southern California. So a uh, big shout out for uh, this, this part of the state. That's also where most of the population lives, not surprisingly. 
Um, the other thing to point out is if you actually enrolled people in products like HMOs, not exclusively, but like HMOs that have integrated care delivery networks uh, to the uh, patients, who I think we're actually trying to serve here, it would be $7 billion in out-of-pocket cost avoidance. And we saw that same extrapolation in the Medicare Advantage market to $3 billion. So if we're looking for solutions to fund the uninsured or to fund undocumented or to uh, offset prescription drug prices or utilization, the money is there. Uh, I think a lot of it comes back to let's be data driven and look at where uh, waste does occur and what we can do about it. And the story to answer, Jack, your first question is um, I'm unapologetic about uh, promotion of integrated and coordinated care uh, combined with comprehensive benefits that have rational and income based uh, uh, cost sharing. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out, this will be a new thing. We all talk a lot about new models, and we've used the phrase ACOs here. The one thing I'd say about ACOs is we all know how to spell them. Um, and they're really nothing really different than what uh, this state has been uh, doing for over 30 years. And I am also uh, old now, so uh, I was part of managed care when it was in vogue. Uh, but what I wanted to show you was this chart will quickly show kind of where we are. Um, the Atlas this year actually flagged members that are participating in ACO products, and that included about uh, half a million people in 2015. So it's a little bit old, dated, but it still includes a lot of people. And for the commercial PPO, you can see the range and the average for those 10 quality measures. Commercial ACO, actually a little bit better, and it pulls up the whole PPO average across the state to some degree, but uh, we still have a ways to go to get to the commercial all-product average, and we still have a ways to go to match uh, what the HMO has been doing for quite some time and continues to improve upon. And as I mentioned earlier, this trend would be roughly the same directionally, even without Kaiser in it. It wouldn't be as, uh, the magnitude would not be as great. The other thing I'll say uh, to finish this is, the ACOs that are being offered in PPO products are actually about 10% more expensive per person um, uh, when compared to the HMO products. So I'm not saying choose HMO products. What I am saying is choose products that promote integrated care and then measure it. Don't take anything for granted because what we see in other data that uh, IHA produces is ACOs, because of the very uh, diverse nature of the financial risk sharing, the very diverse nature of the attribution models, they are performing all over the map. Some are good, some are not great on both cost and quality. And I think if you don't include that in your thinking, it's a problem um, because you really do have to get beyond averages. Averages hide a lot of performance variation. And then the last thing I'll say, other than having a big logo slide, which everybody needs, is uh, if we bring this back to the people we're trying to serve, which are the patients, these things really do make a difference. If you simply matched some of the better performing regions in California, uh, you'd screen thousands more for cancers. You would treat thousands more for diabetes. And uh, also the last thing I'll say, and again, homage to Southern California, but looking towards San Diego now, if we just matched what San Diego is doing regionally, uh, it would mean about $2.6 billion in savings per year uh, that could go to fund other things. So one thing that I will say, I get a little bit of a soapbox on, is um, we see and experience this data at least I have for, for 25 years. We don't do anything about it. I mean, the, the, a lot of the information about things we can do, it's hard, but it's right in front of us. So I think we have to be both intellectually honest about the trade-offs and uh, a challenge to actually pursue those solutions that seem to be working uh, reasonably well already. So thank you. Thanks, Jeff. <clears throat> so Susan. First, ap apologies to Amy, because when she said provider groups, I just sat there with my hands folded. So the California Academy of Family Physicians is obviously a, a provider group, although we sort of hate that term, honestly, because they don't, our doctors don't like it, really. Um, mm -hmm. And in, it won't be any surprise to you, because family medicine physicians are the pure primary care specialty, that my whole thing today will be that our health system would be much better off if there were more family medicine physicians, primary care physicians, and we had a more primary care and preventive care-centric, patient-centric health system. Uh, and I had tons of documentation about uh, 
how other systems perform so much better than we do all over the world, uh, the, at least the more developed countries. But I will cut to the chase a little, and I won't even mention my snarky comments about how you know, Don Berwick said uh, that every system is perfectly designed to get the results it gets, and consequently, ours is bloated, inefficient, and inequitable. Um, so uh, the three uh, ideas that I would like to propose as uh, improving affordability and access and health outcomes would be the reallocation of uh, the uh, state in California at least, spend on primary care. And uh, I would, we would propose at the academy that it be somewhere in the neighborhood of, of 12%. And uh, there are a couple of states that are already engaged in, in yeah. that effort, uh, Oregon and Rhode Island. Rhode Island was first, and they now have uh, pretty good data that were published recently in the New England Journal of Medicine about how well they've done, how indeed the primary care portion of the insurance spend went up significantly, but the overall health spend by the health plans went down significantly. And they attracted more primary care physicians to their state, and they uh, outperformed in terms of price increases uh, the states of Connecticut and Massachusetts. Uh, I think, yeah, those are the two. And so, you know, there's good, good data there. Uh, and the CAFP is actually sponsoring legislation right now that would begin the first step of gathering the data about the primary care spend. There's no information that we're aware of at this point that says what health plans spend on the primary care piece of their business. So the first step is find out what that amount is, and then the second step is uh, see if there might be legislation that could increase it because we're pretty sure it, it needs to be increased. Um, in Oregon, my, my colleague up there said that after they just collected the data, that the health plans looked at it and went, oh, Kaiser's spending so much more than we are, and look how successful they are. And that itself moved uh, the needle a little bit. So the second thing is that we need stable, uh, consistent financial support for primary care residency training programs, especially family medicine and um, the more equitable distribution of graduate medical education dollars that come from Medicare. And actually, uh, we think it ought to be an all-payer support system for graduate medical education. Don't know why uh, Medicare has shouldered the burden for this all along. Um, and in California, we have the Song Brown program. Uh, it is uh, through the Office of Statewide Health Planning and Development. and. Uh, over the years, the uh, family medicine and uh, not just family medicine, actually, programs uh, kind of have been stumbling along with crumbs in the neighborhood of about two to three million dollars from a hospital tax. And in the past year of the legislature, we and other healthcare organizations were able to get $100 million over three years. And it was really, truly stunning. Uh, from the general fund, and the problem is it runs out in two more years. So, you know, consistency of funding, stability of funding is crucial for residency training programs because you can't start in a year and then not have the next two for family medicine at least available to you. Uh, so that's very important to us. Um, we were hoping to get some of the Prop 56 monies uh, that came from the tobacco tax initiative and those are in question right now. And then finally, uh, more emphasis on primary and preventive services to make it a high value, value-based system. And I've loved hearing what you had to say, uh, Kathleen, about primary care and, and also what um, uh, Covered California has done to make sure that all of their enrollees have a primary care physician assigned to them if they don't come into it with one. So um, those would be my ideas. Super. <clears throat> Very concise, very good, thank you. So, so Tam, um, you know, I know you guys have been working on this for a long time. You've got some stuff happening in the legislature. Uh, what do you see happening? What do you, what do you think we need to do? 
Sure. Uh, good to morning. get that access going. Sure, sure thing. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, again, I'm Tam Ma, and I'm with Health Access California, and we're the state healthcare consumer advocacy coalition, working to ensure that all Californians have access to quality and affordable health care, and that they're able to get the care that they need when they need it. So there's a lot of in legislative interest this year in getting California to universal coverage, as well as increasing affordability for those that, that do have co coverage right now. Um, you all may have been following the news. You know, there's lots of debates about, you know, having, you know, do we set up a single-payer health care system? Are there other steps that we could take? And um, Health Access's position is that we, you know, philosophically support single-payer, but we also think that there are other, uh, there's a, you know, that's like a long-term goal and there are short-term goals that we can pursue, um, and particularly, um, you know, in light of the federal administration that's um, there right now, that California can do on its own to move us, um, you know, forward and toward that um, goal. And so right now um, in the legislature, there are at least two dozen bills introduced to deal with universal coverage um, and increasing affordability and addressing health care costs. So this morning, I'm going to focus on two main things. Um, first are the package of bills and ideas to maintain stability in our individual market in covered California. Peter Lee spoke earlier about a lot of the challenges that are facing the individual market. And then the second piece I'm going to uh, address are you know, how do we contain costs across the health care system? and whether it's time for the government to step in and actually start regulating prices. Um, as far as maintaining stability in our individual market and preventing premium spikes, you know, like Peter said earlier, you know, like later this summer and fall, we'll know what the rates are for next year on, in terms of how much you know, people have to pay to when they, if they have to buy coverage their own, uh, on their own, either through Coverage California or through the individual market. Um, you know, California does have a relatively comp uh, competitive competitive marketplace, you know, we've been able to safeguard consumers from the chaos and the confusion that has been created in Washington, D.C., you know, with the marketing efforts, you know, the workarounds that um, Covered California has come up with. However, you know, there continues to be a lot of confusion and a lot of policy changes that the Trump administration has proposed. So right now there are bills, you know, um, that are geared toward, you know, getting people and particularly healthier people into the risk mix at Covered California and into individual market. So there's a bill to keep junk insurance out of the California market. Um, this is something that the Trump administration is really pushing. Um, they call it short-term insurance, and these are plans that are not ACA compliant. They lack consumer protections. They can deny people based on their pre-existing conditions or charge people more. They don't cover all the things that, you know, we've come to understand as being basic necessary health care, like they don't cover, you know, pregnancies, they don't cover, you know, necessary cover, you know, drugs, they have caps on how much they'll pay for hospital stays and whatnot. Um, there's a bill to require health plans to spend more money on care and less on administration and profits. And this is in response to proposed federal rules to lower what's called the medical loss ratio, where they um, want to loosen them up and allow plans to spend less of uh, the premium dollar on care. Um, you know, we need to maintain the individual mandate penalty in some way in California um, to, again, incentivize um, healthy people to stay in the pool and in the risk mix. I think there are um, ways that we can do that, you know, in California and pair it with efforts to make coverage more affordable. Um, you know, and the, a lot of folks, you know, still struggle with affordability and they don't want to be told to buy something that they can't afford. So, um, which brings me to the next thing is really, you know, in terms of like how do you make coverage more affordable for people that have it now um, and build on the federal subsidies that are available. Um, the ACA has made a world of difference, you know, in the individual market, you know, helping people to get health coverage. It, um, you know, despite being called the Affordable Care Act, you know, it was not as affordable as advocates would have liked um, it to be, but we, you know, took what we could, you know, in 2010. But given, you know, the high cost of living in California and, com um, and combined with the fact that we have higher premiums, you know, so a lot of cases these subsidies are not nearly enough. And so we think that there are things that the state can do, you know, like kind of like um, introduce like state level subsidies that layer on top of the federal subsidies to allow people to, um, you know, afford coverage. So, for example, for people who are at the lower end of the income scale, you know, people, individuals making between sixteen and twenty-four thousand dollars a year. It's not very much money, but they pretty much have most of their premiums and their out-of-pocket costs covered with the federal subsidies. However, individuals who make between thirty-five and fifty thousand dollars a year, and again, that's not very much money, and particularly in places like LA, they're asked to pay about nine percent of their income on premiums. 
And 40% of the people in covered California have bronze plans that come with a $6,300 deductible. So they end up, you know, between the premiums that they pay and the $6,300 deductible, they end up spending 20 to 30% of their income on health care and coverage. Um, and you know, that's just not possible for folks, and which means that people, you know, skip doctor's visits, they cut their pills, they avoid necessary tests and treatment. Um, and so I think there are you know, at least four bills in the legislature right now to um, create programs, you know, state-level programs to help people um, you know, afford their premiums and deductibles. There's also you know, I, uh, bills out there to explore you know, creating a public option or a Medi-Cal buy-in in the state. Um, you know, again, looking at ways, are there ways to um, give people options that are more affordable than what's available um, through private insurance? And, um, and so that's kind of, you know, like in a nutshell, kind of like the efforts to really stabilize individual market, make um, coverage accessible and more affordable to individuals. And these are all things that California can do that um, does not require any, you know, significant federal waivers or approvals. This can all be done with state money, you know, um, uh, under state law, you know, building on the framework that we have now. And I know that I'm out of time, but I'll just... Um, really quickly say, you know, in terms of like, you know, kind of like the near term stabilizing individual market, but what do we do about these healthcare costs, you know, um, going forward that, you know, keep going up with no end in sight. And what we do know is that there's a lot of work focused on particular parts of the healthcare system, you know, making health plans and drug companies be more transparent about their prices, you know, bear, um, tinkering with benefit designs, narrow networks, you know, providing financial incentives and financial penalties within the system, integrating care and everything else. But I think, you know, one of the, the challenges that we see is that this feels like a, a lot like whack-a-mole, you know, you kind of try to, you know, um, hit, you know, one thing and then another thing pops up or that same, you know, mole pops up again. Uh, and, you know, it seems like there's also like a major market failure out there where the market's not, you know, able to deal with these rising costs well. And when you have a situation where the largest and most sophisticated purchasers aren't able to negotiate, you know, good, you know, low, lower costs, you know, whether it's CalPERS being what, like the largest state purchaser, one of the largest in the country, or self-funded employers like the Safeways and the Googles of the world, um, health, major health plans like Anthem, Blue Shield, Kaiser, not able to negotiate good prices with doctors and hospitals, there's something wrong there. And the question that I want to pose is, you know, is it time to start talking about, you know, stronger government interventions that move beyond, you know, transparency and data collection to actually regulating prices um, and to hold costs down. So I will pause there and then look forward to the conversation. Great, great, great. <clears throat> so, um, you know, uh, when I was, I, USC is my medical school alma mater. When I was here at USC, I have to re recall back that um, for a patient with myocardial infarction, uh, what we had as treatment in the 70s was bed rest for sometimes six weeks, um, morphine, and oxygen, what wonderful therapy compared to today in cardiology, where you know we go in while you're, you, before your heart attack has really had an effect, open the artery up, and we do all kinds of amazing things. I mean, I took it took a lot of years to get transcatheter aortic valve and other valve procedures approved through FDA. We were the 30th country in the world to do that, even though the technology was developed here in the U.S. Um, so things take a while to get through. But here's the deal: science is on a roll. And we're talking about costs and issues and access and so forth. But, I mean, we're living in, a, in a, an amazing age. And this innovation that's coming, and not to mention all that's going to come out of the genetic um, uh, you know, uh, innovation in the, in the very near future, is going to be very expensive. And so uh, I, I did want to ask the question on innovation. I think a lot of you already mentioned what you thought was the innovation needed. Um, but is there something left that we haven't talked about in terms of innovation um, that could be a game changer and somehow we ought to be including in this discussion that we haven't. So Jack, I just want to put on the table, innovation comes in many forms. Mm -hmm. And I think what we tend to un underemphasize is the innovation that doesn't come out of some place like Silicon Valley. And I say that, um, I've taught um, at the business school at Haas, sorry folks, and at Stanford <laughs> on startup companies. And what I see over and over again is a fascination with the shiny object that um, doesn't really address a lot of the fundamental fragmentation in our industry. And I think what Peter presented uh, for Covered California, that's a huge form of innovation in terms of innovation around benefit design and standardization. No kidding. But we don't, we don't feel the, the same weight of importance as if somebody comes up with something that um, 
gets picked up for a billion dollars sure. or goes IPO or something like that. So I would just put that, and then standardization is a huge part of that. Mm -hmm. And the last thing I'd say is um, execution isn't sexy, but boy, is it needed. Yeah. Um, I think it's far easier to think of the next great thing than it is to actually figure out how to make this work. Absolutely. So, and I think that you covered with the integration part of what you talked about, that, that's innovation as well. There's plenty of innovation there. So, yeah. Just one thing to add. I, um, I think we've seen throughout healthcare that innovation tends to be cost effective, but not necessarily cost saving. It doesn't reduce costs, but, but many of these innovations from a societal perspective we think are worth doing. Right. Well, we have to look at that carefully. So look, look at right. the uh, transcatheter aortic valve thing that I talked about. $35,000 just for the valve. And the, the hospitalization is another 30000 However, um, or, and not, maybe a little less than that for the hospitalization. But the point is, the patients who get it would be, on average, in and out of the hospital for heart failure admissions uh, maybe five or six times in the years before they die. Each time, it's a $35,000 admission. So, you know, um, you, we got to look at the cost-benefit issue. We've got to look at the whole picture there. And some of these innovations are a cost without being able to measure savings. And I, I think we have to do, we'll have to do a little differentiation there. Yes? So I think our value-based insurance design is an innovation that could serve as a model um, for other states, Absolutely. especially where you have high, high numbers of PPOs. Not everyone in California has access to an HMO. So the more we look at coordinated care through benefit design and incentives to actually engage with a personal physician, especially in our rural areas um, where we do not have HMOs, um, I think that's an innovation that, that we're very proud of to have sure. achieved. I think some of the innovations on pharmacy, like Hep C, yes, we can cure Hep C, and, uh, but it came with a high price tag. But it doesn't mean that we don't find ways to actually uh, manage a Hep C program. Right. Other comments? Oh, please. Oh, please. Sure. I think um, with, term, with regards to innovation, it may be also looking at like what innovative things that, that are already being done, whether it's in the United States or around the world. And so when we look at what other countries do, um, particularly countries with universal health care, whether they are single-payer systems or multi-payer systems, you know, they all have government regulating health care prices and the prices that are paid, um, you know, paid to providers, you know, doctors and hospitals throughout the system, um, including the private market if they have one. And we have something that, like that here in the United States now, and it's Medicare, um, you know, that, you know, sets, um, you know, has a fairly public and transparent process for setting rates that are paid um, for services. And other countries have kind of taken this model and adapted it to not just people who are old, older, over 65, but for the entire population and applied it to their commercial markets. And so, you know, I think that's a valuable um, you know, program to kind of look to and see, you know, how has Medicare been able to control costs? Because they have, you know, and they've done it better than the commercial market has been able to. And I think that's something that, you know, California and the United, you know, the United States should look to, yeah. you know, in terms of applying, you know, what Medicare does more broadly across the market. Right, right. Well, I, everybody out there needs to get your questions ready to ask. I'm going to throw one question out first, um, and then well, let's, let's hear from everybody. But, um, We've, you know, we talked about uh, how we, you know, big leap in the system, where we, where we need to go. And I think for, um, uh, for Jerry, uh, for you and for Tam, you know, we, Vermont, you know, made an attempt to go single payer. And then they said, oh, well, it's going to break the budget. The same kind of conversation happened here in California as this was considered a year or so back. Um, why is it that we can't look at the idea of a real system change like that and recognize the administrative savings um, are going to happen? and not factor that in, but rather you know, added costs when we add access to more people. What do you think about that topic? Is that being discussed properly, or are we way off base? So uh, it's not being discussed properly, because what happens is it becomes sort of polarized. Um, yes, and look, uh, we helped contribute uh, to this uh, by publishing a study about a year and a half ago saying that healthcare spending in the, in the state of California is approximately $360 billion. About 70% of that is from public sources. And that uh, you know, our study has been used by both opponents and proponents of single payer to say, you know, look, the, this is how much we're spending. Can't we get to 100% public? We're already more than three, almost three quarters of the way there. So I think what happens in this debate, and it's 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 playing out between Gavin Newsom and uh, 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 Anthony uh, Villaraigosa. The total 
additional spending to move to single payer in the state is uh, a lot less than the total amount. And those two numbers are getting confused. Um, the, the challenge, of course, is the politics. How do we move to a single payer system in the state of California? And I'm ignoring right now the sort of the, the barriers to uh, Congress passing the, the appropriate waivers. How do we put $350 billion of, of spending with efficiency into the state budget um, in a short period of time. And that's a, that is a, a major political challenge. Uh, it doesn't mean that we can't do it. It doesn't mean that we wouldn't achieve savings. And the savings are being ignored. I think academic discussions of this and, and you know policy expert uh, uh, discussions of this issue aside, I think people in the street understand from a common sense perspective that we'd get more value if we didn't have so much uh, administration in the system. Sure. Uh, people can get that message. People would understand that. Um, but the, the political barrier to moving that much on that much spending onto the state budget is something that, in my opinion, the proponents haven't haven't adequately addressed. That there is, at at a minimum caution on the part of many, you know, sort of well-meaning individuals that this is a huge endeavor um, and to do it all at once may be too big of, of a lift. Okay. You might consider like an all-payer step or something on the way. Uh, I've heard uh, the member's comment that uh, HMOs have advantages over PPOs in uh, cost and quality and life expectancy. However, I've also read a good deal of research that, uh, that it, PPOs are a lot more popular among consumers than HMOs. Do you have a solution to that contradiction? Yeah, um, I don't have a solution. I, I guess I just reference back to the comment. Uh, these are hard trade-offs, you know, and PPOs are a proxy for a type of delivery system where access is open. Um, and kind of you get the bill only if you need the care. But I, I think other people have said this along the way. We're now at a point in California, and I think there is a lot of regional discussion about that issue, where uh, consumers are paying uh, up to 20% of the total cost of care, uh, regardless of their income. So I think there, that tail will come back to bite people. And I think the other thing, which is a little bit off point here, but I wanted to put it back on the table. We need to talk more about post-acute care as well. I mean, this, this discussion is largely around acute care, but I think what we really have to think about is the supplemental Medicare Advantage benefit, um, integration of hospice care, a lot of things that actually help people make those kind of choices more comfortably um, and don't limit them to a certain silo of care. Yeah, you, you mentioned in your, in your remarks that uh, you didn't you chose not to to prefer or to recommend an HMO over a PPO, and is that can, is that where you're coming from? Um, well, we're we're a not-for-profit 501c6, just like the NFL, so we try to stay pretty <laughs> neutral. Um, I, I think what people do with the information is really um, important to those organizations. But I think, like Jerry pointed out, I mean, people weaponize whatever you put out there, so it's. Mm -hmm. It's, it, it, we don't want it to be abused, but if we start advocating for one thing or another, we kind of lose our place in the system, um, is how I would put it. Mm -hmm. I do have to make a comment on that. As a purchaser, we look at what's happening in the private sector, and I do agree PPO plans are very popular, especially self-funded PPOs, and the amount of choice is very popular to employees, and that's why we have tried to look at one of our plans and redesign it. The other thing that has happened in the private sector market has been the shift to high deductible plans m married to a, an HSA, a health savings account, which has to be managed by the employee. Um, it's also subject to internal revenue service rules such that the emphasis in spending is on medical care. It's not on prevention. It's not on disease management. And the other aspect that ties to pharmacy is that as pharmacy increases, uh, so, so does the amount that the, the person responsible f uh, in a high deductible plan has to pay. And uh, I see that as uh, fundamental uh, link linkages in providing coverage. 
And I think that there are alternatives that we're offering that I think are going to be attractive, not just to the public sector, but to the private sector. But I really do believe the growing cost of drugs is, is fundamentally flying the idea of a high deductible plan. Yeah, Mike Lowe again. I um, want to, uh, I have a question, I guess for both Susan and, and, uh, and Tam, uh, regarding, uh, I guess in terms of price controls, uh, on a lot of healthcare procedures. Right now in California, I think Medi-Cal has one of the lowest provider uh, rates uh, in the country, which actually has created a lot of accessibility issues for in, under Medi-Cal expansion, that you have a lot of physicians that are refusing to take Medi-Cal uh, under expansion. So I think that, you know, uh, whether that really uh, exacerbated, I think, the issue on access accessibility, and I'd like to know whether Susan and Tam's comments on that coming from the uh, from the primary care physician side and also in terms of an advocacy in terms of government controls on prices? I don't have anything to say about government controls on prices, but uh, it, there's no doubt that Medi-Cal payment rates, particularly for primary care services, are just horrific. And it has had a dampening, if not crushing effect on the ability of uh, family medicine physicians, at any rate, to accept new Medi-Cal patients in particular. We've got some recent statistics at the office about you know the numbers who are continuing to see folks that were in their patient panels, but they can't afford to take any more, and uh, how many are, are you know, not accepting Medi-Cal patients at all. And it, it's not trending in the right direction, considering the expansion of, of uh, Medi-Cal uh, numbers. So, you know, we, we're getting a little bit of the money from the Prop 56. There are, I think, $300 million, something like that, uh, that'll be going to support Medi-Cal payments, but it's a drop in the bucket, really, and it, and it has been severely ignored as long as I've been around, at any rate, and before that. So there... Um so I think with regards to Medicare, that most providers, doctors, hospitals take Medicare um, these days. And you know, th there's also bills pending in the legislature to write, I think really to raise primary care rates um, in Medi-Cal to Medicare levels, and which is a bill that Health Access does support. But I think you know, this is um, really speaking to you know, the need to contain health care costs uh, you know, in a more systemic way. And you know, right now, you know, the prices are going up and there's no in, in sight. And so, you know, we can look at, you know, some of the, you know, ideas that are considered innovative, you know, integrating care, you know, using more accountable care organizations and everything. But that's still a very small, you know, number of, um, you know, providers participating in those um, kinds of programs. And so the question is, you know, do we, you know, sit and wait, you know, another decade or two and see if those work? Or do we just, you know, go in and, you know, do something sooner? So again, you know, a radical but not so radical idea, throwing it out there, you know, don't know if there's any appetite for it or anything, but just something to kind of, you know, um, kind of throw some uh, fun things, stir, stir up the pot a little bit. <laughs> yes, just Jeff. a little factoid again coming out of the Atlas that we weren't expecting, which is kind of the fun part of this, is that while there was a tremendous increase in both obviously the Medi-Cal enrollment numbers and a disproportionate uh, increase in Southern California because of the population, that did not match where the emergency room uh, increases came from. In fact, Southern California had a, especially in Los Angeles uh, County and Inland Empire, had a lower rate yes. of increase in ER enrollment than um, uh, anywhere else in the state. Hmm. So again, this is sort of like, uh, look beyond the averages and start to think about the secondary questions of why would that be? And I'll, you know, again, back to my broken record, about 40% of the people that get Medi-Cal in Los Angeles County get it through an integrated health care group right. uh, that are also serving uh, commercial populations. There may be a bunch of other reasons. I know Kaiser and the UC system uh, saw, the dis saw a disproportionate number of those ER enrollees, but there are stories behind the stories, I think. Amazing. Yeah. Uh, there's a hand up back there. Hi. Uh, my name is Seng. I'm a student here. Uh, from the, uh, Professor Kominsky's, Kominsky's presentation, it, it appears that a lot of people in California are, are uninsured because of their immigration status. But I was curious, or I would like to know, would there be any economic justification to use American tax money to provide health insurance to immigrants? So the public health argument, I am a public health professional, although I'm trained as a policy analyst and health economist, but I've lived in a school of public health for 30 years, um, and I share those values, is that 
Um, illness doesn't uh, look inside your uh, passport. Uh, and that is the, the primary, that's the primary argument. If we don't address this issue as a society, uh, uh, people who are here, whether they're legal or not, will continue to get sick. If they have infectious disease, if they get infectious diseases, those are transported uh, independent of your passport. Um, if they have acute illnesses uh, and show up at the emergency room, we do have EMTALA. We do. Uh, and... <laughs> Republican members of Congress have reminded us over the years that everybody has health insurance because we have EMTALA. So those bills will be paid um, by somebody. Um, and so I think that the, the compelling argument is that these are societal costs. Uh, and I understand and I'm fully aware of all the arguments against um, that, are, that, are, that are put forward. Um, but the fact is that um, we can choose to put our heads in the sand on this issue or take an inclusive approach and try to um, provide uh, adequate health coverage to everybody who lives in the state. Yeah. Yeah, short of bodies on the street, Amtala is a lot more expensive than primary care for the people who need it. <laughs> I think the current administration <laughs> hopes to lower the uninsurance rate by putting immigration status on the 2020 census. That there was a go. joke. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Scott Witt. Um, Dr. Rideout's point about uh, sort of the narrow perspective on innovation, I think, is very valuable. And as an engineer who works with other entrepreneurs, that's something that I'm constantly reminding them of. And so the, the idea of counterintuitive innovation, I think, is something that's a really good approach. It seems to be very effective. So could the panel sort of comment on some, some counterintuitive innovations that you see are maybe not getting attention uh, that really could or should uh, be addressed and how? Dr. Rideout also mentioned that post-acute care is being um, under-reviewed. I run a long-term care program as well, and so I do understand that post-acute care recovery is happening more and more in the home, yet there's not a supportive infrastructure for it. Um, when we also, through our long-term care program, manage care recovery in the home as well, and so we see a big gap. And you're right, it's counterintuitive because technology lives in Silicon Valley, but um, innovation can also be at that transition from inpatient to outpatient post-acute care all the way through continued and sustained better health and better care at home so that they don't complete the circuit and wind up back in the emergency room. So two that I'd mentioned that affect the state in particular, and this is really the plumbing uh, provider directory uh, accuracy and encounter data and leave apart just the information that you can glean from better information. I mean, just the waste that goes on in our system because of all the stupidity of that kind of multiple party chase is un unbelievable. And there's no competitive advantage, really. I mean, I've heard some plans and some provider groups say, well, if my directory is more accurate than yours, I somehow have an advantage. But, you know, having lived through the mess that covered California when we published an all provider directory, you know, people, people get frustrated even if you have the better directory because it's still wildly inaccurate. So those kind of things save the system a lot of money, but because they don't accrue to anybody in particular, and the consumers bear the brunt of a lot of that, um, they don't, I think, get kind of the attention, at least until recently, that they deserve. Yeah. We're, we're, we're going to wrap up in about uh, a couple of minutes. And um, would you have a... Can you, uh, Just one comment. I think we talk a lot about making the healthcare system more efficient, conditional on you getting sick, and not very much about how do we prevent, how do we have a sort of a healthier population. Uh, one of the, you know, President Kennedy's physical fitness and, and, and elementary schools and public schools requirement was to improve the health of the population. Uh, I think it's generational, but educating kids from day one about health and, and the importance of health and that the big gulp, the 32 ounce drink is not so good for them and things of that nature will generationally take time. But I think if you look at like environmental uh, awareness, the younger population generation is much more acute and aware through just they grew up, that's, that's what they grew up with. So I think educating them from a young age on will percolate over yeah. time. So, you know, actually just, I just one final question, uh, and, and that would be, uh, Jeff, to you, uh, Jeff Joyce, I just, I want to say that uh, this is just an area we didn't cover during the, the talk here, and I, I, I'm not gonna get any big pharmaceutical contracts for asking this question, um, but what I, you know, we, um, you're talking about the cost of insulin, you know, and, and I have patient friends and some, uh, in fact, I work with a, some, some diabetes-related treatment programs in New York, and they've been importing insulin 
from Canada, and they're saving 75% of the cost for the same products available here. And there are some loopholes that allow some of that to happen uh, in, in U.S. law, actually. But what I think most of us don't, we, we fail to kind of recognize is that almost all the ingredients of drugs, including biologics, that we're using in this country, far more than 80%, are manufactured elsewhere. And they go through an FDA approval process before they get here. And then sometimes they're compounded here, but they're really, they're, they're just elements of things that are manufactured elsewhere. So, you know, we, that, that's a bold thing to say, but why haven't we thought about maybe reducing the cost of drugs um, simply by taking advantage of some of the costs that the rest of the world uh, enjoys? Well, you're absolutely right, particularly for generics, but in, in general, the manufacturing process is almost all overseas. Yes. Uh, R&D is mostly concentrated in Europe and the U.S., predominantly the U.S., but manufacturing has been, I mean, they've been trying to find efficiencies. Sure. And, and the industry, you know, to their credit, has done that. Some of the drug shortages have been a, a, a response to a, a FDA closing down a, a large factory in China or India for safety violations. Sure. So there, there is a flip side. But... Um, again, I think the manufacturing process is a relatively small part of the total cost. Right, but the, but the, the manufacturing results in uh, a much lower cost without the markups everywhere else besides the Oh, US. if you're going to allow, allow importation, <laughs> that, that yeah. changes everything, right? So Anyway, yeah. it's, it's a thought out there. Well, look, ladies and gentlemen, this has been a great day. I want to, first of all, thank, uh, thank uh, Jerry and Jeff and, and Kathleen, Kathy, Jeff, and Susan, Tam, for doing a good job. Please give them a hand. Um, Thanks, thanks. Yeah, panel stay put. I think that uh, uh, I want to thank, uh, you know, we all want to thank the USC uh, folks here at Schaefer Center. Thank you for what you've done um, and helping bring this about. We're very grateful for the coalition staff um, and uh, for all the members of the coalition. We'd like to invite any of you who want to participate with the NCHC to, to do so. I mean, we can use more, we, we'd like more regional kinds of perspectives in Washington to help what we do with Congress, the administration, and the health sector there. So we invite you to participate. Um, you'd like to be part of this. We're the biggest coalition in health policy that exists right now, so that would be good. John, do you want to say anything as closing? Or, or yeah. Yes, you too. Okay, let's bring our co-chairs up. Thank you very much. Well, I figured we'd save some time and come up together. Um, what a rich discussion all day. I want to, again, second... Um, a, a round of applause for all of our presenters and panelists that get, shared their last three hours of expertise with us. Thank you. And it's the leaders in all of us that advocate on behalf of others in California and the nation. And my challenge to you still exists. So keep the dialogue going. So please continue to um, have the dialogue, watch the videos, make connections, and only again together can we really make that difference that we've talked about um, across the last few hours. And I, I also wanted to give a plug um, back on Jack's comments is we need to align ourselves with like-minded coalitions. And the National Coalition on Healthcare is one of the largest um, addressing these issues today. And I believe that um, CalPERS aligning ourselves with the National Coalition has really made a difference, and I encourage all of you to do the same. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn the podium over to John. Um, and again, thank you, NCHC and the um, USC Schaefer Center for inviting CalPERS out today. Great. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you, Leanne. I have to I had mentioned in closing uh, the support of the uh, Betty and Gordon Moore Foundation uh, for this. And you also might be interested to know we're going to have a, uh, another event just like this tomorrow in Austin, Texas. And uh, what you learn when you go around the country is how different healthcare is from one place to another. Uh, it's very rich. Uh, but uh, if we're going to solve this as a country, we're going to have to take that variation into effect. So let me try to sum up, if, I, if you forgive me for this, uh, with five key points. It's hard to reduce this thing to five. But first, uh, we are on an unsustainable path in terms of cost. And uh, that's going to play itself out in different ways. Uh, one way, certainly, that Peter emphasized is uh, we face a, a, a very uh, risky future in terms of the individual market and what could happen there. Uh, we also face uh, continued pressures to cost shift to employees, to individuals, uh, you know, uh, within public programs even. Uh, this is not sustainable. 
I think that's got to be uh, our first uh, understanding. Uh, the second uh, piece is there's no one answer. Uh, there's no one group that's going to fix this. Uh, this has got to be a collective enterprise. Uh, physician leadership is crucial, but physicians can't solve this by themselves. The plans can't solve this by themselves. The pharma sector can't solve this by themselves. Uh, it is going to take uh, probably a greater role for government, uh, but again, uh, the, the national debate is often focused on very simple ideas, you know, Medicare negotiation, single payer. Uh, that's not going to get us uh, very far. So we need uh, those of us in this room, stakeholders, uh, to come together uh, around a more um, plausible set of initiatives. That's number two. Third point is there is some consensus, and we heard it today, that uh, integrated uh, health care plans offer real hope, that uh, that is a way to go forward that uh, works in terms of quality, it works in terms of cost. Whether they're HMOs or Medicare Advantage plans, um, we have to move away from fee-for-service and fragmented care to more coordinated care, especially for those with chronic conditions. Number four, we had a very broad set of discussions, but look, let's remind ourselves what we didn't address. We didn't really address rural health care. We didn't address mental health. We didn't really address long-term care needs. We didn't really address population health prevention and the social determinants, all of which are really crucial. Where the discussion f is focused and, and it's ne inevitable is where we spend the money today. And it's a money-focused discussion. But if we really were talking about health and a people-focused discussion, we'd have to take all these other uh, factors into account. And so finally, uh, let me just say we need uh, government to be a uh, part of the solution here. We can't, uh, we can have uh, very constructive initiatives elsewhere, but we're not going to solve this without uh, government being a uh, more constructive player. And again, we're going to need uh, a greater level of consensus to try to overcome the current politicization uh, that's inhibiting uh, any progress today. And uh, that's a big job. But I have confidence that uh, health care is the number one issue uh, among the public. Uh, this will be debated this fall. And uh, hopefully elections can have an impact here on our ability to go forward. So with that, thank you very, very much. And uh, have a great day.